Uh, so I have been doing interviews with a neuroscientist, but today I have a roboticist in the Nementa offices with us, and uh, because I'm an opportunist, I decided to ask if he would be interviewed because he's doing some really interesting thing in robotics. Um, so I'll just go ahead and introduce you now. This is uh, Dr. Pierre Neubert from the Chemnitz Institute of Technology in Germany, right? I get that right? Almost. It's <laughs> oh. the University of Technology. The University of Technology. Thank you for the correction. Um, so tell me about what got you into robotics? Like, were you a young kid in East Germany daydreaming about science fiction or? <laughs> um, maybe that's, that's part of the story. Um, so at the time when I really decided or got into robotics, I was, was studying computer science in Chemnitz. And uh, I visited a hands-on course of uh, Peter Brotzel, where we had to program small robots to, to solve uh, navigation tasks in the maze. And uh, straightforward from, from this hands-on course, uh, I visited a, a course where we have to, had to read a scientific paper and uh, discuss the, this scientific paper. And that's really amazing to, to see how close science is to this practical, actually uh, moving thing in this little maze. Mm. And I really like the idea of, of combining computer science, electrical engineering and mechanics, artificial intelligence to, to build something real and to, to, to do research in this area. So you were thinking about applications sort of from the beginning. You saw a way that this science can be immediately applied, potentially. And so at this time, I was studying computer science. So most of the time, I've been sitting in front of, uh, of a keyboard ah. and, and hacking. Or, yeah. or reading uh, everything you build books. in computer science is imaginary. <laughs> yeah, and from from my childhood on, I really like to to build things with my hands. And at this point in time, it looks like robotics is a, a good way to combine both. Right now, I'm building other things, no robots, but programming robots, and that's fun too. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, uh, you probably know the format of interview that I do, so let me get the cards out. Topics that are robotics topics um, this time, not neuroscience, but they're also um, sort of interesting, I think, to the work that we do at Nementa. So I've written them here. One, and we're going to talk about grid cells and the illusion of reality because we have to have some philosophy mixed in with the interview every once in a while. Uh, and there's some work that you've done in a related field and rat slam that involves grid cells, and that's very relevant to what we're doing. I also want to talk about hyper vectors, uh, which we can explain. And can you tell me maybe what this is? It's a quiz. It's a pun. Uh, it's like a, uh, something super, because it has a cape. And yeah, it's a rectangle. It's, it's a super pixel. pixel. <laughs> I'm <laughs> nice sorry. Drawing. I had to do that. OK. Yeah. So we're talking about super pixels, which you have some experience with. And then long-term robots, which I think this is really intriguing. Uh, because it's like science fiction. So, uh, I, you know what? You can, you can pick what topic we start with, and I already know the, like, what I want to ask you. OK, I, I really like uh, this drawing. OK. Uh, let's, let's start with <laughs> We'll do super, super pixel. Pixels. Yeah. So wait, explain what a super pixel is. OK. Um, so basically, or technically, a super pixel is just a group of pixels um, to, to, to have this idea to group neighbor it similarly looking pixel and to have some some entity in an image that contains more information than an individual pixel but is not yet an object so um, it's all about avoiding a, a premature hard decision for a very long time to to detect some object in, in an image to see okay it's a cat um, the task was to for the general pipeline was to first segment out the foreground object from the background and then decide what this foreground object is. Mm. And this is very often a very hard problem. Think of a very cluttered desk with a lot of stuff on it. And I ask you, okay, what is the object in this image? Yeah. And there are a lot of objects. 
Yeah. You have no idea if I'm talking about the whole desk or the keyboard or the Mac or whatever. And at this point in time, it's hard to, to segment out the single foreground object. And in particular, um, if you think of some occluded parts of the boundary of some object, it's really hard to get them from, from pixels bottom up. Yeah, if you mean if, you're, if you've got something in front of something else and it's obscuring a boundary that would be used to define the super pixel, yeah. that's... No, no, not the super pixel, the object. The object, So right. the idea is, at this point in time, if only the, the image, but no idea what is the, the task, what is the, the object I'm looking for, not to really make this hard decision, this is the outline of my object, mm -hmm. but to find something um, more general, uh, an over-segmentation of the image, so split it not into like two objects, but let's say into 100 or 1000 super pixels, mm -hmm. which are still uh, much, much, uh, much less than 1 million pixels. Uh, is the idea to be able to encode the super pixels in different ways because of the different parts of the image? No, I think the, the idea is to encode the, the objects in terms of super pixels. To say, okay, this object uh, consists of like three or ten super pixels. Mm. Oh, I see. And but so the super pixels is a method of sort of pre-processing something so that something else can do object recognition. Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, I think a very important aspect is to not uh, create one super pixel segmentation of the image, but multiple segmentations, overlapping segmentations. Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of segment soup, yeah. and then you have uh, uh, plenty of choices to, to build your objects uh, upon these basic elements. So how would you create different ways to segment up the same image? Uh, there are plenty of algorithms, and uh, in most cases it's just uh, the parameter choice to say, okay, please algorithms segment the image into 100 uh, super pixels and again in 200. Mm -hmm. and now we have two overlapping uh, segmentations and in total 300 super pixels. So this leads me to another question because we're talking about computer image, <laughs> computer vision, right? Uh, and how camera footage or what, however we're recording, you know, light essentially. How do we get that encoded into a system that a robot can understand and make sense of? And this is just one way or one uh, tactic, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, in the end, it's turned into bits and bytes that the robot has to understand. What is that encoding generally in robotics uh, for sensors to, to give to the robot? I think if it's possible to talk about uh, a general encoding of, of sensor information in robotics, then I think it's in terms of coordinate frames to say I have something like a robot-centered coordinate frame and all my sensor information is relative to this uh, coordinate frame so it happens to be 3D points mm -hmm. or some other three-dimensional structures in the world or if the robot is just moving on the ground plane on the floor. So, so base, essentially trying to construct a model with, yeah. uh, with whatever visual input or uh, sensory input we get. Yeah, a geometrical model. A geometrical model so based on an egocentric coordinate frame. Um, that's one part of the story. Uh -huh. I think in robotics very often uh, global coordinate frames are used. You okay. really have something that is map-centered centered in the world. Right. To be able to create a large model of the whole world. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Rat Slam a bit too. Yeah, but what, uh, uh, I want to uh, you say this, this is one part of the story to have this, uh, this reference frame for representation. Mm -hmm. And I think the other part of the stories uh, are probabilities. Mm -hmm. To really try to um, formulate everything in, in terms of probabilities to be able to combine all the information. I start thinking about way. predictions when you say probabilities. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part of the story. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So even in, in the vision, in, in, in trying to understand where things are in the world, we're even talking about probabilities of where we think things might, we might be or other things might be yeah. when we're trying to discover. Yeah. yeah. And again, these probabilities are some kind of avoiding premature hard decisions. Not to say, okay, I'm very sure that at this point in the space there is some obstacle, mm. but there's some uncertainty assigned to it. It yeah. might be at a slightly different pose. Yeah. It's kind of sort of like giving a bit of an intuition. Uh, it's that sort of process. It's not a long search for where I am. It's just, yep. yeah. Okay, cool. So let's pick a, a, another topic. What do you think? Um, we could okay, go you straight. already started with um, grid cells. Yeah. Grid cells. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, let's talk about slam real quick. It's hard to talk about grid cells without rat slam. So first of all, slam is what? Okay, it's uh, an acronym. It's simultaneous localization and mapping. I'll put it right there. <laughs> and um, imagine a robot enters a new unknown place in the world, and it wants to create a map of this environment and simultaneously know where it is in the map. So if you have a good estimate of your, your position, it's easy to take all your sensor measurements mm -hmm. to create a map. And if you have a map, it's very, it's more or less easy to, to know where you are in the map based on your sensor information. But if you have neither of them, it's really a challenging task. Yeah. And it has been a very hard problem and well-researched problem in robotics for like two decades. Yeah, well, localization is the problem, right? Uh, and it's a big field in robotics. And I guess SLAM is sort of an area of robotics trying to solve that localization mapping problem. Yeah. Um, so one of the most interesting methods of solving that problem uh, is in this Rat Slam paper, which I'll link in the description and I'll, I'll bring some graphics of. And that's what I wanted to talk about because they use these grid cell modules or sort of the idea of how grid cells work in the interrhinal cortex uh, to help a robot navigate through the world, which is really interesting. Experience map is somehow inspired by um, by, by place cells mm -hmm. in the brain, and I think, as far as I know, they share some similarities. So, uh, each experience and experience map is associated to some uh, sensory input from the environment and some some postcode in the grid cell network. It's a continuous attractor network that is connected to the uh, visual input of the uh, of the robot and also to, to self-motion cues. So there's some activity in this, in this post-cell network, mm -hmm. and whenever the, the robot moves, this activity pattern also moves in this, uh, this post-cell network. And um, these patterns of, in this post-cell network are associated to, to local views, so images from the environment, and whenever the robot closes a loop and revisits some place in the environment, then it faces very similar visual input, mm -hmm. and this induces energy to the post cell network at this previous connected right. uh, parts. Yeah, it's interesting. There's always places along the path that look similar to other places along the path, and that, and there's some confusion there. It's like, wait, where am I? I and that the same thing happens to people too. <laughs> yeah, and for a very long time in robotics, it has been uh, a big problem to avoid false positive. Uh, loop closures right. to say I think I am revisiting a place but in fact I'm at a new place it's just looking very similar right and these dynamics in this post cell network are something really interesting to to filter these informations to integrate information over time mm -hmm. and to to handle these uh, false positive loop closures yeah uh, yeah that is interesting because the more you run the loops, the more you experience the world, the better your representation of the world is going to be. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Let's let's see what else we can talk about here. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by by long-term robots and why it's science fictionary. Well, uh, I, I think about you know ro <laughs> robots that we shoot to other planets to. To explore and occasionally come back and report on what they found. You know, we can't really do that very well today. Um, yeah. I'm reminded of some discussion we had about the Curiosity on Mars. Uh, how does that work today? How much automation goes on in that long-term robot? Um, so I think Curiosity is, to a large parts, really tail-operated. That's a good thing because we are not really good at robustly working autonomous robots. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what what my concerns are about long-term robots. You're talking robot. about robot survival, you know, being able yeah. to, function to function in general. To function in the wild. Yes. Because uh, I think in, in the long term, if the robot operates in some environment over a longer period of time, it will face changing environments, right. changing changes of its tasks. Um, and to, to deal with these things that are not known at the point in time when we model and build the robot. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real challenge of long-term robots. That's the unique challenge, is anticipating how its environment will change. Uh, no, not really to anticipating this in advance, 
but to make the robot capa capable of handling these changes. Right. And in particular, changes that we didn't thought of. Right. So you, <laughs> for long-term robots to truly be robust and survive, we need some form of AGI, it seems, so that it can be truly yeah. autonomous. So, of course, if we had AGI, this could solve long-term robots. <laughs> right. But m there might be other ways to to create long-term robots without AGI. That's but true. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure a lot of people are working on that. Um, what kind of what are some other examples of long-term robotic the need for long-term robotics? Even on this planet. I mean, there do we have uh, applications that people are asking for? Uh, yeah, of course I think if you want to to have some some robot that works in, in your household or that works on a construction site uh, and do useful things. Right. It has to work for a long time without any help of a professional tailor operator or something. Yeah, like not like the, uh, the little delivery robots that always have a human right exactly. behind them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I guess there's a lot of things they can do yeah. uh, when you think about it. Uh, uh, but even construction robots, something that's just continually moving supplies where they need to be, um, to removing debris, you know, collecting garbage, trash, whatever. Yeah. Uh, something you can put out there and say, do your job, and come back to me in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, we have one more topic that I think we can go over. And this is the, this is the hardest topic for me, is hypervectors. What we're really talking about is high dimensional vectors, right? Maybe you can describe the hypervector from a robotic standpoint, and then we can talk about how it relates to SDRs and HDM theory. Um, so uh, right now, I think there's not too much of a robotic standpoint uh, on hypervectors, because only very little work has been done. Uh, oh, so this isn't, to, to this is not like this is a standard communication format or protocol anywhere. Um, um, not consciously, yeah. because I think uh, the, the technically a hypervector is just a very high dimensional vector, like, like over 1, a thousand, yeah, yeah, one thousand dimensions, yeah, and and they can have binaries or floats values yeah, in them. Yeah, it's just to say, okay, I have this high dimensional space with this really huge capacity, right? Um, and technically, an image is a hypervector. Yeah, that so makes sense. That makes sense, but. Um, Images, image processing, we usually do not exploit some positive aspects of, of hypervectors. Right. And the, it might be very interesting to see how we can use these positive aspects of hypervectors to program robots and to, to let robots also manu manipulate their own programs mm -hmm. in the very same way as they handle uh, every other kind of data. Uh, there's operations that uh, you can perform on between hypervectors and and well on most hypervectors I guess it depends on exactly how they're structured. Um, so you are talking about these uh, vector symbolic architectures. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the idea is to 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 define a set of operators on on hypervectors with some uh, well chosen properties mm -hmm. to to do useful things to have something like. Uh, a toolbox to solve problems uh, that exploit the positive aspects of, of hypervectors. And so, for example, it's more or less easy to, to encode something like a reactive behavior of a robot uh -huh. using this language of vector symbolic architectures. And in principle, they are also able to, to solve higher cognitive tasks like language processing and so on. Um, so it seems like a very useful uh, toolbox. Now, this is. I, I try to think of a hypervector in robotics as a state of something. Um, is that the right way to think of it? A state that can change over time? Well, of course you can encode a state as a hypervector, but the interesting thing is you can encode everything as a hypervector. So, for example, you can encode your sensor device itself as a hypervector, mm -hmm. its sensor measurements as a hypervector, the way the, the program controls its, its robots as a hypervector and the way how the sensor input is uh, projected into, onto some, uh, some actions also as a hypervector. So not just states, but actions, events, things like that yeah. can, can also be sort of communicated in the same language. 
Yeah, that's and, and operated upon with the same operators. Yeah, that's the idea. Right. So that's interesting. How how does that miss? Um, how does that relate to SDRs? Because SDRs are basically a hypervector of sparse binary yeah, items. That's it. Yeah. So uh, so SDRs by themselves are an example for for, hyper, for a hypervector space, and um, they share some of the um, beneficial properties. Uh, I'm not sure if it's that easy to define these uh, operators that are used in these vector symbolic architectures. Yeah, it's not SDRs. it's not like a one to one union, or it's not like they they match directly to binary operations. So a, a union is one of the operators, right? Um, and the, the second important operator of, of, of binding um, can be implemented as an as an um, exclusive or, mm -hmm. but then the result is no longer as sparse. sparse right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but it's still very. I mean, just the high dimensionality of it um, feels very familiar as far as because of the SDRs yeah. that have the same high dimensional properties as hypervectors. So there's just a, the space is just enormous. Uh, the potential for utilizing that space is just enormous. Right? Exactly. That's the intriguing thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Dr. Norbert, I guess we have run out of time and topics here, but I appreciate you sitting down with me and having this interview, and uh, it's Later. been a pleasure. So thank Me you very too. much. I hope you guys have enjoyed this interview. Uh, please come back for the next one, which I don't know who it's going to be or what I'm going to be interviewing. Some scientists doing something interesting. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thank you.